Hello, everyone's Forest Focus. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by a former colleague and current friend in the form of the Athletics Nottingham Forest reporter, Paul Taylor, as we discuss uh, some latest news, uh, get our thoughts on the season, and maybe some transfer chat looking ahead to the summer. Tails, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Who are you? Yes, good. Have you listened to Sports Horn? That was a reference to Sports Horn, which I suspect might be up your street. I don't know. I, I haven't actually, no. No, I, I, I haven't caught that one. Our mutual friend Mikey Clark and I are big fans of Sports Horn podcast. Uh, should yeah, should, former I, should I be listening to it? Well, yeah, but you recommended to me Atletico Mints about 10 years ago, <laughs> and I still haven't listened to that. So, yeah, yeah, check out Sports Horn. Yeah, with, that's with Bob Mortimer, isn't it, Atletico Mints? Oh, yes. Yeah, though they haven't really done any new episodes for about six months, which is a bit frustrating. Um, no. Do you want Gone Fishing? Yeah, he, 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 gone Fishing is brilliant. It's one of my favourite chill out television programs because you can just sort of sit and watch it and everything in the world feels nice and cosy and, and lovely and there's no stresses in the world no relegation fights no points deductions no no nothing to worry about you know exactly i can watch a bit of gone fishing clips on youtube just uh, of an evening to make you like you can feel nice and relaxed as you say anything with bob moore tomorrow i like anyway Right, that was a really weird start. So that was probably <laughs> the strangest start to a podcast we've ever done. So yes, you mentioned relegation fights and points deductions and all that stuff. So let's start talking a bit of Forest. I mean, how do you think this season's panned out? I saw, a, I was just flicking through Twitter earlier and a fan says, I hate this season, I can't wait for it to be over. I don't think it's been quite that bad, but it feels like it's been a bit stunted and stilted around. We'll, we'll have a good result like at Chelsea and then a load of new players come in. You know, Steve Cooper goes and then Nuno comes in and things go well, but then there's FFP and AFCON. It mm. feels like it's never got going to me. How have you felt, you know, watching all these games from the press box? Well, you, you're right. You kind of summed up in, in a short fashion there. You, the, the the demise of Cooper felt quite long and and, and drawn out. And, uh, you know, there were moments where you thought he was going to go before he did and it didn't happen, which in, in some sense is good because you wanted to see him given an opportunity to turn things around. Uh, but then... Ultimately, it felt a bit drawn out. Then Nuno came in, and I, I feel a bit sorry for Nuno because he's had so much to deal with uh, since he's come in, some of which he would have known about, like losing players to AFCON he would have been aware of. Whether he was aware of the potential points deduction and the you know kind of FFP issues that are hanging over the club, I, I'm not sure. He has been asked in press conferences whether he was aware when he took the job on of of this hanging over the club, and he was he, he didn't really give a... A straight answer. A straight answer. He, he he does look. He's quite a a careworn, stressed-looking figure, is Nuno, and it's very easy to put two and two together and think that all of that comes from what he's taken on. And uh, more accurately, I think perhaps talking to people who covered Spurs and and covered Wolves while he was in charge, that that just seems to be his general demeanour. I don't think he's somebody that walks around with a beaming smile on his face on a on a regular basis. Maybe today, Valentine's Day, maybe he's feeling the love and he's he's a bit happier, who knows? But uh, generally, I think that's just the way he is. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you've got to feel for him a little bit because he hasn't had any consistency in team selection. He hasn't had any uh, luck with injuries. He hasn't had uh, the opportunity to, to use a large portion of his players because they've been away at AFCON. All of these little things added up have, have really made life difficult for him at the start of, of his tenure. And, and while there's been some positives, for sure, you know, the, the performance at Newcastle probably, against Newcastle, probably epitomised uh, where things are at the minute and that they look really good in an attacking sense, looked like they could score a lot of goals, but still had that defensive vulnerability and that, that, that painful vulnerability from set pieces that doesn't seem to be changing at all. No, I mean, that goes back to Steve Cooper, certainly, and um, the set-piece coach. Is it Simon Rusk? Is that his name? Mm. I think it is. He's catching a lot of uh, strays at the moment. And Calvin Wilson was on, on Monday with us, and he was saying it's not on coaches, it's on players to mm. put their bodies on the line. You know, the, the second goal against Newcastle in particular, was when, you know, when it's bouncing twice in your box mm. and one centre-half setting to another to score, I mean... That's not acceptable in the Premier League or non-league, really, is it? I mean, what you know, is it unfair to point the finger at the set piece coach? Do you think, and the players have to step up and take responsibility now in these final fourteen games? I think both things are true. You know, he, he's been brought in to do a job, and uh, you talk to the players, and they they really like him. He, he apparently is a really positive, upbeat, 
friendly, uh, hardworking and intense guy. He, he, he's made a positive impression on the players. Uh, I, I kind of tend to agree with Kelvin a little bit in the sense that you've got to be taking responsibility as a centre-half and as a player full stop when you're defending a set piece. You've got to be committed, you've got to be focused, you've got to be concentrated uh, and you, you've got to deal with uh, what a relatively easy or straightforward at least situations. Uh, again, it kind of goes back a little bit to to this thing about consistency of team selection. You know, they've had they've tried three different goalkeepers. There's been no consistency in the goalkeeper position. So defenders don't. I, I, I know, I'm aware that I'm making excuses a little bit here, but I'm just trying to think through in my mind what the potential factors in all this might be. You know, defenders might not know if the goalkeeper is going to come for something because he's only played a couple of games or it's changed and it's a different player to what they used to. You know, Matt Sells is coming in and only played a couple of games. He's still finding his feet and apparently isn't a, a goalkeeper that necessarily likes to come for a lot of crosses. Uh, Matt Turner was the opposite. His stats for coming to, for crosses were actually really good. He was very good at coming for crosses and defenders might have anticipated that if the ball's coming into the box, Turner's coming for it. Now that dynamic might have changed a little bit. Then you've got central defenders who all of a sudden might have a, dif a different defender alongside them. Again, I'm aware that this sounds like I'm making an excuse. I'm not. But all of these things added up. This lack of consistency, the change in personnel, uh, you know, the, the change in manager, all of it adds up to little things like this potentially becoming problems when there is that, uh, you know, not that regularity, not that understanding and not the run of games playing together that, build relationships and build an understanding that, that that this team clearly doesn't have in a minute. Yeah, I want to come back to keepers shortly. It's interesting you say about, you know, the set piece nightmare. I mean, is West Ham kind of up next, the perfect barometer of if they can solve these problems? Because, yeah, we went to the London Stadium and it mm. was probably the worst example, along with Saturday, of our uh, frailties at set pieces. It, it was a game, another game where I thought we played really well, but let us, you know, just couldn't defend the balls into the box. Is this going to be a real test of where if Forest have got the resolve to stay up now on Saturday, do you think, or not? Uh, yes and no. And, and set pieces might be an issue. Uh, I, I actually checked this out a little bit. I, I did some research for a piece I did at, at, at the weekend and uh, kind of, in my mind, West Ham were set-piece specialists because of what we saw at the London Stadium. And they're actually not. They've scored six goals from set-pieces this season, which is among the lowest in the Premier League. It's just that on that afternoon at, at, in London, in the capital, Forest made them look good as they conceded two goals from corners. Uh, and again, you know, whoever they're playing, it's going to be an issue in the current climate when they keep conceding these, these goals and these opportunities to the opposition from corners and from free kicks. Every time... Uh, Every time the opposition get one, you kind of wince a little bit and start looking through your fingers, fearing that there's there's going to be a goal. Uh, and it, it it is something you've got to sort out. You know, do you do you just do you go old school and and bring in Felipe and Bolly now he's back, and and just have your best, most committed, experienced, nasty in some ways defenders come in and just tell them to do a job, defend. Uh, don't worry about anything else. Just uh, do your job, do the basics, head the ball, kick the ball, get rid of it, and 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 almost go back to basics. God, I hate that phrase, uh, but you know what I mean. Just just yeah, do something to resolve the problem on a basic level that that that, that might at least address it. Uh, I think what Nuno's tried to do since he came in is uh, make Forest a little bit more attack minded, and he has. I think they've scored. 14 no they've scored 13 goals i think but conceded 14 or it might be the other way around but either way they score a lot more goals than they used to under cooper it was one a game an exact average of one a game throughout his entire tenure uh you know under nuno it's nearly two and and that's a big improvement but they look more defensively vulnerable at the same time and you you have to wonder where your priority should be. Does he need to go a bit more Cooper-esque and make Forrest a bit more difficult to beat in, in the short term just to get a few points on the board? I, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. Or does he try and be attack-minded and, you know, be Kevin Keegan's Newcastle and win every game 4-3, which is probably a little bit harder and probably very much more entertaining, but uh, probably not for the faint-hearted either. No, I think you're right. I mean, I think personally, maybe Bolly or Felipe will come in against West Ham, but they... 
yeah, they just they, like you say, there's so so many options in the squad and so little consistency of selection. It's a bit of a double-edged sword, really. Um, let's talk about goalkeepers then. Obviously, we ended up with Matt Sells at the end of a pretty, uh, I'm not going to say long, I don't know how long the search was, but a pretty, pretty hectic search. What was your take on all that? I know you did a really good piece in The Athletic about the interest in David De Gea. I mean, was that... Uh, a real strong inquiry, or was they just putting out feelers to say, would you fancy it? How, how far did that one go before we go into the rest of the keeper search? There were two two very definite inquiries. Uh, one earlier in the window uh, when they were politely sort of knocked back. He, he, he said, you know, he, he wasn't that interested. And then they tried again in the final days of the window when they, they, they really pushed and said, look, even the people around him, I think, you know, tried to convince him that the, the prospect of regular first team football ahead of a major tournament in the summer might might be a bonus for him, but uh, I, you have to phrase this carefully because it's not it, it, it it's not in any way meant to be demeaning to Forrest, but it, David De Gea is a massive player. He's a big big player who is going to be attracting interest from the the top clubs of the world, or should be at least. But you know, it, it's fair to say he probably isn't. Otherwise, he'd have joined one of them at the minute. But uh, you can see why he wants to pick his next move carefully, and uh, equally, I could see an argument for why he, he might want to, to might have wanted to join Forest for a few months just to get some first team football under his belt. Um, you know, would that have done his career some good? Do you have a fully committed player in that situation? I don't know because you know, is he going to come here and want to give his all, or is he just going to see it as a stepping stone to something else? Maybe they've ended up with. Uh, happy medium in, in somebody like Matt Sells, who who does want to further his career by being at Forest and doing well for Forest, and will be invested in the fortunes of the football team more than more than David De Gea might be. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. I mean, I I can see the merits in De Gea coming and signing a six month deal, but if he doesn't really fancy it, then perhaps I don't know. It depends if we get stay up or get relegated, I guess. But <laughs> yeah, I can see why Matt Sells came in. And does it create a problem in the summer now? We've got three goalkeepers on you know, three or four year deals in the Codemos, mm. Turner, Sells. I assume Wayne Hennessy will go in the summer, but are you anticipating well, at least the Codemos goes, maybe Turner goes? It's going to be pretty tumultuous in the summer, do you think, in that area of the team? I think Black Ademos or Turner will go, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, what What I would say as well, during the January window, the the there were at least half a dozen, six or seven approaches made for keepers in the, in the, uh, in the final few days of the window. It, it, it was uh, just through the circumstances of the situation. It, it was, it was chaotic by its nature because Forrest hadn't planned to be looking for a keeper in January. Even in the first few weeks of his tenure, Nuno himself thought Turner and Vlacodemos would be enough to get him through to the end of the season. He was quite happy to perhaps look at the situation again in the summer. It was only when there were a few more errors and a few more games where the goalkeeper ended up in the spotlight that he decided he wanted somebody, which left Forrest almost at square one. They'll have had some targets in mind, but nobody that they were ever thinking, right, we've got to go for another one in January. Uh, so I do have some sympathy for them. It did it did paint a picture of of, of some sort of haphazard recruitment. And, and I guess, without contradicting myself, it was, but it was more through circumstance than anything Forrest had done wrong. They found themselves in a situation needing a last minute purchase of a goalkeeper and had to go out and, and try and, uh, and try and get one. Uh, the, the one, the one out of all the names that were linked, the only two that were not true were, were Kasper Schmeichel. There, there wasn't any real interest in him and Jack Butland, uh, which I think was, uh, I don't know whether Rangers wanted rid of him or whether they were trying to get a, a move for whatever reason up there, but there was no interest from Forrest in, in him. I think it was just perhaps a, an easy one for them because they could say that Ross Wilson was at Forrest and might have had some interest in him because of that, but the, the, there wasn't any interest in that. But all the others, there were inquiries or or bids made for, for all of them as Forrest looked to try and make that addition uh, late in the window. And just because Sells might have been the fifth, sixth or seventh one that they went for, I wouldn't necessarily say that's a huge reflection on his quality. I think it was just, uh, you know, they 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 had to do a kind of scattergun approach to, to try and get a player in that they 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 wanted. And I know that Nuno was quite a big fan of of Sells in particular, so he's he's going to be quite happy with with the player they ultimately got over 
over the line to to join the club and hopefully improve that position between now and the end of the season. Am I being a bit doe-eyed and feeling a bit sorry for Turner? Do you think? Because you say you know it's a it's a it's a cut and cut you know cutthroat business in the sense Premier League goalkeeping you're either good enough or you're not. And I guess Turner's shown that unfortunately he probably hasn't met the standard. But I don't know. He seems like a good guy and a good teammate. And uh, have you got any insight on how the how he's viewed around the club? Because he looks like a good bloke. And I really want him to do well, but I just just haven't really, worked out for him. They really like him, and he's he's a. Uh, He's a popular figure and he's hugely professional. When you talk to him, he's he's a very driven, very motivated character. And uh, any of his faults at the minute won't be through a lack of work rate or ethic. He, he's he's a, a nice guy, but a, a very focused guy at the same time. And I, I do feel a little bit sorry for him uh, because he, he came to England initially with Arsenal to, to earn his chance to play in the Premier League and uh, never really got that opportunity at Arsenal, came to Forest, And it, I'm not for a minute saying that he, he's been great. He hasn't, that he'd made mistakes. But it, it came became almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. Every time, every small mistake he made uh, was, was spotlighted straight away. Uh, the, the game he played in the FA Cup was kind of, it kind of personified this because the, the save he made for the, 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 the in the build-up to, uh, the goal, the first goal was was uh, it, it, at first viewing, it looked like a really spectacular save. It looked like he'd done a really good job to push a long range shot onto the post. And there were there were a few others in the press box around me as well, sort of going, "Wow, what a great save!" When you saw a replay of it, it, it wasn't that spectacular. It wasn't brilliant. It, it, he might even have done better. But there are lots of people who were saying it was an absolute clanger, partly because I think it's Matt Turner and. I don't think it was a clanger necessarily. And it kind of, all the focus was on that one moment in the game and not on the fact that he made three or four of the really good saves and the penalty save to keep Forrest in the FA Cup. And, and a game that he probably finished deserving a little bit of credit and even praise for playing reasonably well, you know, maybe a seven, six hours, six out of 10, seven out of 10 performance, had some good moments without being spectacular, but still contributed to the to the win ultimately. He ended up being castigated because largely of what had become before, and I, you kind of fear that whatever happens now with Matt Turner, that's always going to be hang over him. The next time he plays, if if Sells gets an injury or if Nuno decides that Turner is going to play in the FA Cup, then he's going to be immediately at that starting point where every single mistake he makes is going to be analysed more than anything positive he does, and that's the only reason I feel sorry for him because he's got to escape from that to kind of prove that he is good enough to to succeed at Forest and. Uh, that that might be hard work to begin with. Yeah, that goal's kind of a good. Uh, it's a bit emblematic of where we are because you know if you look at that goal, probably near Kate should come out and close down the shot, or someone should come out and close down the shot, and mm. then we don't react well to the ball coming off the post, and no one tracks the runner, and mm. there's a kind of a catalogue of errors, and then you see v, v Newcastle, you know Matt Turner's line goal, and we've still conceded three goals, and uh, we can look at ourselves uh, for failings again. I mean. I suppose every club's like this, but even when we worked together at the posts, there were players who you felt were kind of the scapegoat when everything was going wrong. Ben Osborne springs to mind straight away. And, I know where you know, go. <laughs> well, it was Joe Worrell, and you know, then it was Matt Turner, and then <coughs> over the weekends, um, every, the reason we lost was Ryan Yates, according to Twitter. And I don't think Ryan Yates had a good game. And now he wouldn't be a regular. He would, you know, he wouldn't be in my midfield too for West Ham if Sangare is fit and. Uh, the, the coaches, you know, assess that he's ready to go. It would be Sangari and Dominga. So I'm not saying Ryan Yates it should be a regular Premier League starter, but I don't know. You know, you've covered Forest for I don't know 20 years. Does it feel like there's always a player in the spotlight that you know is the the reason for every ill or not? Yeah, yeah, there, there is. There absolutely is. There's there's always one scapegoat, and uh, I, I thought Ryan Yates had emerged from the other side of that, but but apparently he hasn't. Uh, he, uh, I feel a bit sorry for him. Do you know what? He 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 would be a regular start for me in the side uh, in in away games. I, I think he's the kind of player yeah. that you need in away games, uh, and I I can't take credit for this, and nor can I remember it. So I'm going to bring up something I <laughs> I can't really talk about, which is brilliant. Uh, I saw a stat the other day about how he how Forrest is so much better away from home with the eights inside. Uh, that, that most of the away wins that Forrest have secured in in, in recent years have, have come with him in the team, uh, or even the away points. Uh, 
I maybe I'll look that up afterwards and send it to you. I'm can... just looking at. I think is it WT analysis. I might be. It might be. Oh, yeah. I'll... Yes, it was then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it was a great stat, and if you can find it, that'd be amazing. Uh, yeah. But I'll look it up while you're talking. Yeah. But yeah, carry on about about Yates and yeah, the, all the perceptions around Forest players have been you know the reason for all our ills. I, I think the, there's certain players who get criticism for being something they're not. Uh, you know. The, there used to be the comparison between Yates and Carvalho. Like everyone wanted Carvalho to play because they thought he was this match-winning, cultured, fop-haired genius, and and he 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 had that in his locker. He on his day he was brilliant, but he was wildly inconsistent and uh, would produce it one game in every five. Ryan Yates is uh, a player who does a lot of things that perhaps go under the radar, that aren't spectacular, that aren't glamorous that aren't things that are going to grab newspaper headlines but if you're a player in that team or if you're the manager of that team you're going to love him for it and he will do it consistently in every single game he plays he you know what you're going to get from him you know he's reliable you know he's consistent you know he's an absolute workhorse he's the epitome of professionalism uh and it it always winds me up a little bit because people on social media will just say so he's in the team because he tries hard and it's so much more than that he, he he contributes on so many levels, and uh, I, I just think if you if you had a team of players with the same attitude as Ryan Yates, who has literally dragged himself into the Premier League, having played in all five divisions of English football, uh, he is a player, admittedly, who succeeds as much because of his attitude as his ability. But that is not a criticism. It's it's something that. If every player could improve their ability a little bit through their attitude, there would be so many players who had better careers than they did in the past. And and I don't think that's something that you should be criticised for. I think it's something you should be lauded for. And uh, whilst I wouldn't necessarily have him in the team at home, if you want to be more attack-minded, maybe I, I would definitely have him playing away from home in the midfield too, alongside A and other. He'd be one of my first names on the team sheet. I, I think he's uh, he's he's. He's, he's brilliant. He's brilliant to what he does and uh, will forever be underappreciated. What would be amusing is, you know, every single manager that's come to Forest has used him. The last 10 managers off the top of my head, I'm guessing, have all had him as one of their first names on the team sheet. And there is interest in him from around the rest of the Premier League. So it, it would be amusing on some levels if he if he went to another Premier League club and flourished. Would that would that change the uh, the view of him amongst his, his critics here? I'd, 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 I'd like to find... In a way, I'd like to find out, but in another way, I wouldn't want to see him go because it's Valentine's Day and I love Rai Rai. <laughs> I know, yeah. I mean, every time you watch on Sky, he's, he always comes up in the commentary and the co commentators tend to, you know, uh, love him begrudgingly, I think, in a way for the way he goes about the game. I found those stats while you were talking. Uh, so it's WT underscore analysis on Twitter. Um, since turning to the Premier League, Yates has played 23 away games where Forrest gained 17 points. Uh, 11 of those games they conceded one goal or kept a clean sheet in uh, away games without Ryan Yates that's played eight they've gained zero points so I mean there's, there's a few caveats around minutes played in that but you can see the you can see uh, the general pattern that around away games he does have an impact I suppose home games tails it's more like you want someone in there who's going to exert a measure of control and him and Dominguez are quite similar and I think I, I do think Dominguez is a better player and has been mm. really good it's just maybe, yeah, I, I agree. In away games, there's definitely a place for Ryan Yates for me. I mean, why, do, why do managers keep picking him? Because it's not just like he runs around a lot. There's more to it than that, isn't there? Exactly. I mean, they, they pick him because they could trust him and because he, he does all the... Uh, he does all the things that occasionally go under the radar, you know, perhaps when... It's the kind of things that are probably appreciated more by uh, his, his teammates than perhaps people in the stands, you know, maybe he'll make a, a, a lung busting run to close somebody down that allows somebody else to pick off the ball 20 yards away. You know, it, it, just his endeavour and, and work rate and determination probably uh, just make Forrest a, a, a better side when he's in the team. Yeah, true, true. Yes, we know he does give away a lot of free kicks sometimes. But, but uh, that's he wins the thing, and I, 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 I'm surprised that more referees haven't picked up on this. But he is the master of winning the softest free kicks in the world as well. He, uh, the, the Ryan Yates flop where he falls on the ball and looks aghast in one fluid moment. It is, is, is just, it's, it, it. You'd hate it if you're on the opposition team, but you kind of 
have to love it when you're winning the free kicks that you know he does and probably aren't free kicks but who cares true and he probably should get booked more but he's really good with refs isn't he like oh sorry ref didn't mean it you know arm on the shoulder you're doing a great job yourself <laughs> all that kind of stuff yeah. <laughs> what a great game you're having <laughs> yeah exactly right uh let's just take a pause to uh give a word for our sponsors the trent navigation uh you can get down to nav on saturday for all the pre-match build-up and games they're showing uh either side of three o'clock so enjoy that uh it's wednesday night so tonight is curry night uh eight pound fifty for all the food on offer there i do ask guests when they come on what's their favorite curry and you uh, I, you are a foodie tales i think you mm. you prefer greek food i would say but if uh if they were oh, you going out good. for curry tonight Oh, what the, would you be having? A, a lamb madras, or uh, I, I, I do like a hot curry. Uh, I, I, I make a nice lamb madras with a lamb shank, which is really nice. It takes about three or four hours to cook, but it's it's absolute belter. Uh, other than Missus doesn't like lamb, so I don't cook it very often these days. Uh, maybe How maybe she not it, like lamb. I, I who knows? It, it's a mystery. Uh, when I first met her, she was entirely vegetarian, so I've done well to to get, it, <laughs> get her eating some meat. Uh, I'd probably rephrase that. Uh, yeah, but, you know, <laughs> it, 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 yeah, uh, I, I I like a lamb madras. Well, I, I occasionally have a fowl. I really do like a hot curry, but uh, I like to feel like I've had a challenge. Uh, yeah, I should edit that bit, but I probably won't. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's just talk about as we head into the summer. You've got a cough like I have. Yeah. Um, Let's assume that we stay, in fact, even if we go down, but um, we've got a lot of players out of contract who I expect will move on. And there's going to be interesting players like Morgan Gibbs-White. And we've discussed the goalkeeping situation. Mm. We have Chris Wood's one of the out of contract players. I mean, it's the Forest way. There's always quite a lot of business. Well, there wasn't in January. But are you expecting quite a summer of change again or not? Yeah, probably. You know, uh, it seems to be set up for it, doesn't it, with the players that are out of contract and... Uh, just you feel like Nuno will want to stamp his own influence on things, but obviously the elephant in the room is what 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 division Forest are in. You know, if they stay in the Premier League, they'll have a plan A, and if they get relegated, there'll be a a plan B. I imagine there'll be quite a few players they'd have to move on just to a balance the books and b uh, you know just make sure that they're. Uh, keeping players happy that there'd be players in the squad who I'm sure in the best will of the world probably wouldn't fancy playing their championship. Uh, mm -hmm. So you might have to take that into account as well. Uh, there would naturally be a, a degree of change there, but you know, you look at the teams that went down last year and they didn't, I don't think off the top of my head, make huge amounts of changes. Uh, and, and, you know, I think Leeds had it. The Leeds didn't, they did it quite curiously, didn't they? Didn't they send quite a few out on loan? Uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe that's the way to go. Kind of try and get some of your big earners off the off the wage bill by loaning them back to the Premier League, and then hopefully when you get back there, you kind of say, "Well, we'll have them back now." Uh, but uh, hopefully that's not a a path Forest end up having to take. I, I still, I know things look pretty bleak at the minute when you look at the the run of results, you know, uh, and the, the fact that they aren't winning regularly, but. Uh, for some reason, I still feel vaguely optimistic that that they'll uh, they'll get enough. You know, when players like Sangare come back and Bolly, uh, Ina even, I think Ina's very good. Uh, they'll they'll they've got the front four that look brilliant without even adding Rayner into it. You've probably got five players there now who could form a front four that's very good. Once you get more like Sangare back in midfield and more consistency in the defence, once Sell settles in. Um, I think all of a sudden you you could quite quickly be looking at a team that will be more more competitive and more uh, capable of picking up points in the Premier League and uh, getting Forest up the table. Even if even if you know fingers crossed it doesn't happen, but say they do get a points deduction and it ends up being uh, five or six points, and this is just guesswork, total guesswork. We don't know what the points deduction might be if there is one at all. Uh, but you know, I think even five or six points, Forest are capable. Of surviving if they can get a bit of momentum going in in the next few games that's probably important if they carry on not winning for another two or three games then you, you probably 
start to admit that it looks a bit bleaker. But if they can get a couple of good results in the next few weeks, then uh, the, the mood might change quite quickly. Yeah, I think you're right. There's an interesting spell coming up. We did, um, myself and Pete Blackburn, who also used to work with us, mm. uh, went through the the fixtures upcoming. And um, yeah, Forest have got a really interesting bracket of games. We discussed this yesterday. West Ham at home, Villa away, Liverpool at home, Brighton away. Looks pretty tough. Mm. Um, but if we can get through that with four points, uh, yeah, you kind of feel like West Ham might be three of them, touch wood. And then you go into this really defining run of Luton, Crystal Palace, Fulham, uh, then Spurs, but then it's Wolves, then it's Everton, and then two of the last three games, obviously Sheffield United and Burnley. Mm. I, I think we you know there's going to be you don't want the last day drama, but I feel like there might be might in there. Yeah, yeah, uh, it feels that way. Uh, you know, when you mention Sheffield United and you just think of that playoff game, and you think. Could, could there be another landmark game against Sheffield United to come, you know, one way or another? And they'd be in the mood to get revenge, wouldn't they? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I just... You can analyse each game individually. You can you can look at the opposition. But Forrest have got this curious habit of... Well, they had a curious habit of picking up results that you don't necessarily anticipate. You know, winning at Newcastle, uh, beating Liverpool at home months ago under last season under under Cooper, you know, beating Arsenal to to stay up. They have a habit of pulling out unexpected results when uh when you don't necessarily believe that they're gonna happen and hopefully they can get back into that routine uh pretty quickly and uh we can all stop thinking about what they'd have to do to get their squad acclimatized for the championship. <laughs> Cause that is a bleak thought. Oh god! After all those years, yeah, uh, being in the championship, yeah. But I like you say, if, if they're just tying up defensively, they're going to score enough goals. They've got better attacks than the teams around them. I certainly think so. Yeah, there's scope for scope for improvement. I'm not sure the other teams have, which kind of gives me hope. I mean, it does show that we've been yeah. letting ourselves down a bit. But if we fix our woes, then yeah, I think we we can climb the table certainly. Do um, you know what? I really want to see. I want to see. I want to see Gibbs Y. I want to see a Langer. I want to see a Wanyi. Uh, and Murillo and and how they develop as Premier League players uh, in this team, like over a period of seasons. You know, Omar Bam- Bamadeli as well. He's made a really positive impression. I think they've got a player on their hands there that, uh, you know, had to wait a long time for his opportunity. It has been a little bit unlucky to drop out. Uh, but, you know, there, there's so many players who you think are going to, who are capable of making a really big impact on the Premier League and you want it to be with Forest and you want it to be as this, uh, you know, they, you want them to be together at the city ground. And I think that's what Steve Cooper was very good at. He built a team that everyone was invested in and even the lone players, you know, the Jed Spencers of this world, uh, James Garner, everybody sort of bonded with them. And you look at players like Gibbs White and Alanga and Murillo and you, you feel like they're players that that could win over the hearts if they haven't already probably in the case of Gibbs White of the fans and have that same kind of bond and you want you want to see that retained and it'd be an awful shame if they got relegated and and some of that was was lost I'm getting not yeah. uh, I'm getting not emotional that's not the right word but nostalgic maybe I don't know true but they do have a lot of Premier League quality players they've got mm. a better team than last season in mm. in a lot of ways um but yeah, I think uh, I'm still optimistic. Such would that they'll be they'll they'll be all right. Uh, I think hopefully. Um, last topic I want to ask you about talking off the city ground. Um, I think they're doing stuff on the floodlights and potentially starting that filling in the corners thing. But the long term project has always been redeveloping the Peter Taylor stand. I mean, it's gone quite quiet on that. I know they've been working on it in the background, but do you still believe uh, deep down that that will happen eventually, or is it on the back burner now? No, I think it'll happen. I think I think it's going to happen. Uh, I think uh, that's that's why they appointed uh, uh, the, the the new chairman. Uh, his background is within that field of expertise. Uh, you know, working as he does, um, you know, as a senior figure in Benoit, the architects. He, it's his area of professionalism. He, he uh, I'm sure, will be a very driving character in. Uh, in getting this over the line and, and done as, as as quickly as possible. Uh, I think it's important for the future of the club, uh, you know, just having the kind of Champions League class facilities that they're aiming to have 
as you know, the new Peter Taylor stand. I, I think getting that done and getting that in place would establish the notion that Forest are a, a Premier League force, even more so off the pitch. They, they need to get that done on the pitch as well, of course. That's um, probably the primary uh, challenge this season is to to make sure they retain their Premier League status and then focus on all the off the pitch stuff and uh, really demonstrate that they're a club that's moving towards being a uh, a regular face and a regular feature in, in, in the top flight where they've waited so many years to get into and um, wouldn't it be great if they were in the in the top flight next season and uh, there was some movement on the, the redevelopment work and uh, we could all look forward to a, a future in, in the Premier League, hopefully. Certainly, certainly. Right, I think we'll uh, leave it there. If you have uh, enjoyed this, do us a favour, hit like, hit subscribe. Uh, you can consider coming a channel member on YouTube and you can give us uh, a five-star review, hopefully on iTunes and Spotify. Uh, we always end with any of business tales on this podcast. So my only thing I was going to say was, I know there's a lot of fury around, uh, did I say fury or furore? I didn't say that word very well. Uh, there's a lot of angst around Twitter on ticket prices for the FA Cup tie against Manchester United, uh, up to 45 or £50 pounds, uh, for adults. So we'll discuss that tomorrow on the podcast with Greg Mitchell and uh, I think Temps is on as well. And it'll be interesting to get their takes from different side of the fence because Temps works for Trent Bridge and, uh, Mark, it's big events, so he'll have a uh, good insight, I'm sure, and obviously Greg will uh, as well. Uh, that's at 3.30 tomorrow. Um, uh, oh, it's not Greg, actually. It's Temps, Emily Anderson and Mark Southern, so we'll get their take on that anyway. Uh, smooth as ever, knowing my uh, own, own uh, running order, Tails. Right, as I say, any of the business, anything you want to say, Tails, anything you want to plug for your work, uh, for The Athletic, the, the floor is yours. <laughs> well, uh, I just did a uh, what was quite a uh moving interview with with Harry Toffolo, who's one of the most honest and open interviews I've ever done with a footballer who was talking about his experiences of the last uh year and uh obviously the betting charges he faced which were historic from quite a few years ago but nevertheless you know betting's been in the spotlight in recent years and it, it he talked very openly about how it had left him at a low point in his life and had impacted hugely on his mental health and how his mental health, in fact, was one of the reasons why he found himself betting. And uh, it was just a really open and honest interview about how all of that experience had left him with this desire to to help others and how he uh, is part of the Tricky to Talk scheme at Forest now. But more than that, uh, wants just to talk to people, anybody that wants to talk to him who wants help or feels like they're uh, in a in a difficult place with their mental health he he feels like he's got a platform now to help others and I, I just thought that was a really refreshing kind of unexpected attitude that you wouldn't necessarily get from the average Premier League footballer and it was just uh, a pleasure to talk to him about it so you can you can find that interview on The Athletic and uh, uh, hopefully you'll you'll see what a nice guy he comes across as he, he just seems like a totally genuine uh, guy who who made some mistakes in the past learned from them and wants to use his experience for for the positive now yeah he does seem like one of those guys you really root for and i hope he stays at forest for um you know a long time whether he's first choice left back or not he seems like a good bloke who we all want to do well right like i say we'll leave it there uh we will be back tomorrow at half three with a full west ham preview hopefully something with forest ladies on friday and then saturday post-match stream uh, in the evening after the West Ham match, hopefully talking about a positive result. So in the meantime, uh, Paul Taylor, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for having me. No problem at all. Well, I say no problem. You've done me the favour by coming on. Uh, have a good day, everyone, and uh, we shall see you soon.